ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki a hau, te he Māori ora. In a mana, in a reo, e rā raka te rama te nā koutou katoa. Um, tēnē tu rāru o te maru e, o nā mena whenua, uh, ka te māmoi, uh, waitaha, uh, ka, um, kaitahu, uh, no mai, haramai, welcome. Um, uh, I stand here on behalf of the people of this place, ka te māmoi, waitaha, and kaitahu you and welcome you. Um, ke te whare uh, tū nei, uh, tēnā koe, tū tonu, tū tonu, to the house that stands here, stand forever. Um, actually, and in case of emergencies, please use the exits provided and uh, we are sure that the house will, will try and protect us as much as possible. Uh, and a mate hairi hairi hoki atura ki te pau. To those that have passed, um, we uh, wish you well in your onward journey. <coughs> um, no Otopotia Hau, or Kowayao, no Otopotia Hau, Ko Kotarani te Iwi, He Kaimahi Hahata Fanewananga o Otako, Ko Richard Blakey Tako Ingawa. Um, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Richard Blakey. I'm Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Enterprise at the University of Otago. And on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and our senior leadership group, it's my pleasure and privilege to be host for you this evening for this inaugural professor lecture. Um, uh, Ke te rangatira, ehoraki, Jerry, um, Lynette, uh, Michael, uh, tēnā koe, to our distinguished professors who are here with us, welcome to those distinguished professors of our university, other staff, uh, faculty, supporters and visitors both here and online, welcome, welcome, thrice welcome and particularly welcome to friends, whānau and supporters of Jerry. I think um, for my offici officiating at these ceremonies, uh, it's a record in terms of the number of people that have to be acknowledged. I think there are more that will be acknowledged later, but to your wife Barbara, uh, kids, Ben James I think is online, uh, Sam who I think has a role somewhere in the wider university, kia ora Sam, um, Marco, Lucy, uh, wives, partners, eight grandchildren and many, many more others. Uh, to you a very, very special welcome as uh, inaugural professorial lecture is a is a, um, an occasion of high uh, importance for us as a university, but for, for the families of the, of the person being recognised, it's also very important. I hope you're getting a nice dinner somewhere afterwards as a result of this. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of these lectures is um, multifold. Principally, it's to celebrate achievement of academic promotion to our highest category at the University of Otago, that category of professor. It is not a position that every academic will achieve. It is, uh, it is the pinnacle position and it does require outstanding levels of achievement across all of the areas of um, activity of a university academic across teaching, research and service in order to warrant that promotion. Achievement of not only sustained outstanding performance in those areas but also leadership and I think we see through the prof professorial lectures not only a recognition through the professor themselves professing to you our audience the kinds of things that they believe that they've done over their career but you will see shine through this tonight I'm sure um, the outstanding leadership that Jerry has um, provided to us as a university. <clears throat> We measure uh, and make our assessment of promotion uh, not just ourselves, but we get um, international uh, referees to uh, give us quality assurance of that. And so it's based on our high standards and the views of international referees that this promotion has been awarded. <clears throat> my assessment, I don't get involved directly in this because it's a very difficult process, but my assessment when looking at your resume, Jerry, is that you have certainly um, provided outstanding uh, leadership. My area is research and you've demonstrated very clearly that research is important to incorporate within teaching and clinical practice. You've shown that research saves lives quite directly and in the long run research um, over many, many years by understanding issues, developing solutions, implementing those and recognising that our university motto Sapare Aude says that we need to dare to be wise. In many cases implementing solutions in willing patients for the first time ever. And I, I'm really looking forward to, to this, to hear your story because not only is this a recognition of outstanding service and leadership to the university, but for some of our 
us as senior academics, it's what we call academic spa time. It actually allows us to step out of our daily routine and our daily grind and facing the issues that we have to look back and really reflect on what we are as an institution, a place of learning where we have outstanding students supported by outstanding teachers who know their disciplines, profess it to the best of their ability. So the, the order of proceedings is that <clears throat> Lindley will um, introduce your topic and you in a little bit more detail. You'll give your lecture. Uh, Michael will uh, sum up with a vote of thanks and then, provided everything goes well, invite everyone to the staff club for refreshments. I'm sorry those online, uh, you won't, you'll have to deal with your own refreshments. Uh, but to keep things running, I would now simply want to invite uh, Professor Lindley Anderson to introduce you to the, to, uh, the audience in more detail, but um, in doing so would offer the heartiest congratulations on behalf of the university for your well-deserved promotion. Noreira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, Call Lindley Anderson toko and noa. Um, my name's Lindley Anderson and I am the Deputy Dean of the Dunedin School of Medicine and I am here on behalf of uh, the, um, the Dean, uh, Professor Joe Baxter. So I want to tell you a little bit more about Jerry. Well, Gerald, Jared Wilkins is a graduate of Otago Medical School who returned to, to Dunedin from Boston in 1989 as a clinical, academic and consultant cardiologist in a joint clinical role at Dunedin Hospital. This means that he's had a long and celebrated association uh, with the Dunedin School of Medicine, which we uh, want to acknowledge today. His research interests, as you will come to know, are wide, including new medical device research, exercise physiology studies with members of Heart Otago Research Group, rural health outcomes, genetics, selenium and experimental models of cardiorenal physiology. He has participated in more than 50 multi-centre international outcome studies of new therapies that have reshaped clinical cardiology. He has pioneered many new cardiology procedures in New Zealand, such as coronary and carotid stenting and transradial and transapical interventional approaches. He has an absolute passion for teaching and he loves teaching, he tells me, um, and he has this role as an academic teacher. He's received numerous awards from medical students over the years, and is, he is recognised internationally for his academic and technical contributions to interventional and structural heart disease through academic meetings and live case de demonstrations. He has held numerous leadership positions in Dunedin Hospital and national organisations. Now, just before we get on to what Jerry's going to be talking about today, um, I just want to acknowledge um, Dame Norma Restio, who is in the audience today, and thank you very much for um, attending. Um, uh, Jerry, I'm going to hand over very soon to um, Professor Wilkins to talk about his experiences of an academic clinician in the development of cardiovascular care throughout 40 years of clinical trials, new device development and fundamental science projects. And as he describes it, it's been a blast. So um, please join with me in celebrating and welcoming Professor Jared Wilkins. Thank you. <laughs> I said to someone on the way and a bit of heckling would be good, it sounds like it's going to be one of those nights. Um, I am honoured to be able to give a lecture uh, to the public and in the public uh, my friends, my family, some of my grandchildren who are on their best behaviour, hi George, and uh, to my son James, Amy and uh, grandchildren in Portsmouth UK, hi James. Um, I had a lot of fun thinking about what to include in a public lecture. Um, there were lots of choices. I decided to go right down the middle and just talk about history. I thought that would be more interesting than anything else. 
even naming this was kind of fun. I, I was trying to find some way of conveying to you that cardiology has really changed outcomes. And a phrase kept coming back into my mind, giant steps. And then it kept saying giant steps is what you take. And then of course walking on the moon and I realized that I was actually humming along to this guy, the police <laughs> and Sting. And I looked up when that was, and that was 1979. Now, I suddenly realized I had to use this as the title because in 1979, a lot happened to a boy from a small rural school in Southland. The most important thing that I did that year was that I married Barb, and from there on in, all things became much easier, frankly. And that's probably the most important thing that happened in 1979. But actually, in that year, I had just graduated in December, and I was doing my first house staff years. And I happened to do cardiology with Norma Restio and cardiac surgery with Pat Malloy back to back, more or less, in that year. And I was hooked. And I'm the luckiest guy because I found the job that I love to go to every day. Even though there are bad days, I still love it. For the musicians in the audience, and there are a number of them here, Giant Steps also is, if you look it up, is about John Coltrane. And he introduced some very dystonic kind of jumps and jazz, which people thought, oh, that's disgusting. But they got used to it, and it's just part of harmony now. And it seemed to me when I read that as well that that's not a bad allegory for a lot of medicine and it's a particularly good allegory for the way cardiology developed over the last 40 years. So what's so giant about cardiology? Well, I'm going to go right back to the beginning. I'm showing you life expectancy graph for a New Zealander over a number of years. Along the bottom there are the years and you can see that about when I was born then your mother died at 72 on average and your father died at 67. Now, you could say a lot of things about that. It, it would explain, for instance, why men retired at 65. They had about two years with their slippers on and then they're likely to be dead. Now, if you look over here, the most recent data, nearly 2020, men live to over 80, about 81, and women to about 83 or 4. What happened along there to improve New Zealanders survival so much. Well, we've got to go and look at uh, actual mortality tables. So this is the opposite. This is deaths falling. And in that critical age group we're just talking about, 35 to 69, you can see there is an astronomical fall in death rates per 100,000 for men, particularly, and also for women, to the, fit, to the point that in that time I'm talking about, there's a 60% reduction in death rate for this group. Now, of course, if a lot more people live through to 69, that gets a lot of people through to 83 or 4, right? Why? I'm now showing you the mortality drop just for coronary disease in that death, in that group. It's astronomically bigger again, it's 70 to 80%. And yes, you know what I'm gonna say because I'm a cardiologist. Here's the graph for everything, and here's that for cardiac death, death from a heart attack. You can see that the only thing that comes close to explaining this fall is the death from cardiovascular disease. All cancer deaths are coming down, and as I get older, I want that to fall rapidly. If you put motor vehicle deaths, you're not really meant to put them on top of each other academically, but this is to try and give you an idea. You can see that the biggest contributor to bigger survival in New Zealand, and in effect, the two big things are getting rid of infant mortality and child death with vaccines, and really, the management of cardiovascular disease is the biggest player by far to date. I hope that everything else does the same. So if we now look at our survival on average for men and for women, you can see that in the year 2020, on average, half of us live to 82.06 years, and half live longer again, right? And that that's a little worse than Australia, 
and we're doing better than the US, where in effect survival is falling and newer data shows that it's fallen again. Now that's another whole discussion why a Western country is falling. So the question that I'm going to try and address quickly, hopefully in an intelligible way, is why did cardiovascular mortality fall so much? And to understand that, you've got to go back to what was going on in about 1960 and 1970 when I graduated at the end of that decade. Well, at that time, heart attacks couldn't be turned off. And so the emphasis is on recovery if you were lucky enough to survive. There was a very high acute and medium term mortality from a heart attack. The defibrillator had been invented, and if you want to see the Dunedin Hospital's original defibrillator, it's in the waiting room up on the seventh floor. It's bigger than your fridge at home, and you could only afford one, so a coronary care was built around the defibrillator. That's the origin of coronary care units. The defibrillator costs so much. And there were effectively, in the early days, morphine, oxygen, and lignocaine. Two of those, it's not even clear, actually work, are beneficial anymore, right? Now, if you want to see more of this, one of my mentors uh, was in this movie, Ted Nye, which goes through his efforts to start rehab in New Zealand. And I've just, will put in one little snippet from this movie. The nurse is about to ask, and when will he go back to work, or when will he leave hospital? Will the patient be in hospital? Well, this naturally depends on his progress and the presence or otherwise of complications. In a straightforward case, probably two to four weeks. In any case, uh, it's not customary to allow a patient back to work sooner than about two months after his original attack. Three months may be necessary. Now, that was the baseline. And in fact, Ted was espousing a kind of radical idea that people would leave hospital that quickly. So I'm going to talk about a personal view. I'm just going to change my screen so I can see it. Of why those giant steps were made in cardiology. And I'm going to view it through the lens of my own practice. And it's been a long and lucky career from my point of view. Because I just happened to be at the right time and right place. And I had a blast. Dame Norma Restio, who I'm lucky to have attending here, was my mentor and taught me cardiology. She suffered quite a bit with me, I think, at times. But over three years, she had been performing outcomes research in the coronary care unit of Dunedin Hospital. And I remember filling in paperwork every Monday morning, Norma, with you, and making sure that it was done. And over that period, it reflects here what was going on in mortality rates. And from that, there's been a number of publications. I've put three of them down there. But look, just look at this data. In the 1979 to 81 period, what we call the biggest heart attacks are called ST elevation infarcts, tar ST. The mortality rate was 18%. So if we turn that into what you want to know, that meant that 74 out of 403 people died in hospital from their heart attack. And by 1989 to 91, that had dropped a bit as the beginnings of new treatments came along. And then look, the newer ideas of stopping heart attacks, ameliorating damage, estimating, and all the things I'm going to talk about came along. Mortality starts to drop like a stone. And indeed, in contemporary work now, people joke that it's kind of hard to die from a heart attack. The mortality rates are now 3 or 4% across the board. Indeed, if you look at the, from one of these publications, if you look at who was the biggest winners, here is people under 75, here are people over 75. The biggest winners of all are the elderly who have got the most to lose when they have a heart attack. They are much more likely to die. Now, you're going to say that that's what nature does to you, but in fact, that belief held back much of what we do for many years. It was also the year that I engaged in the first clinical mega trial. Now, mega trials are well known to people in cardiology. 
These are the times where very large trials are conducted to get a clear answer. Does this idea work, this drug, this strategy, or does it not against a placebo? And you get a clear answer and the, whatever the treatment is gone or it's there in the middle of good practice. This was called the Miami trial, metoprolol, a beta blocker drug in acute myocardial infarction, pretty cute name. And basically what this demonstrated, if you look, you either got given fake metoprolol or metoprolol IV as you're having your heart attack. I remember doing this. It actually demonstrated that across the board it didn't make any difference at all. But if you looked at the high risk people with heart attacks, there was a difference, a small survival benefit. And in fact, all the trials of beta blockers subsequently showed that. And that took nearly 6,000 patients around the world to answer that, and that's what the mega trials are. University hospitals doing combined research. It also happened to be the time where coronary angioplasty started. Here's a paper that I collected much of the data for and then disappeared to Boston and was published later by Charles Ilsley, who was one of my mentors. Look what he's saying. Since May 1981, 39 men and 11 women, mean age 55, have undergone balloon angioplasty at Dunedin Hospital was performed in 34 with stable angina, 13 with unstable, and already 6% of them were having a heart attack. That was kind of a revolutionary even then. How did that happen? This guy, Mike Ablett, lives in Australia, I spoke to within the last few months, did the first angioplasty in New Zealand because someone had to, was his reasoning, right? And I think that was true. There was no skill base to do this, but he had attended a, a meeting on how to go about doing this by the founder, Andreas Gronsig in Bern, and he came back and in the right case started the technique. You can see that by our current standards, that wasn't overly successful in everyone, 70% single vessel, 62%, etc. here. Five, ten percent underwent emergency bypass grafting because it didn't work out. Now, how long is it for those of you who work in cath labs, and I can see lots of my colleagues here, how often does that happen now? Almost never. But this was the beginning of a revolution that's reflected in mortality rates and ease of managing heart attacks now. And to explain this, I'm going to have to give you a little brief history of interventional cardiology. So it starts right back here with a guy called Werner Forsman, who in 1929 had the outrageous courage to put a catheter in his heart. And I'll get to that in a minute. I can see my brother Peter, who doesn't like this stuff, <laughs> slightly going, oh my God. In 1958, a guy called Mason Sohn squirted dye in a, the big blood vessel above the heart, and the catheter jumped into a coronary artery everyone, oh my God, you'll kill the patient. But in fact, it didn't. And he therefore went on, had the courage to go ahead and take pictures of coronary arteries. And then the shapes of catheters got so easy that you could teach monkeys to do a coronary angiogram, as someone once said to me. And then Gronsig invented the first balloon. Mike Ablett was doing it soon after it was invented in 1981. And I was standing in the back room watching him do it because I was training as a registrar. Soon after that, in Kansas, uh, these two guys started doing treating heart attacks by opening arteries with balloons. And one of those guys is from Otago University, from Southland, Barry Rutherford, who's still alive in Kansas and is much fated as one of the founders of this whole deal. He's from Otago University, in other words. Sigvart put the first stent in. I started stenting in New Zealand in 1989. Uh, yeah, around, yeah, it's moved a bit, about 1990. And then stents came into common use and trials of what to do strategies overwhelmingly supported doing angiograms in everyone. This is Werner Fersman's story. I said he put a catheter in a heart. He put it in his own heart. He was told not to do this. So one night, with the help of a nurse, he cut down on his own brachial vein and threat there was no catheters for hearts. He got a urinary catheter and he measured the distance and he pushed it up to his heart. 
And then he walked down to the x-ray department and he had this photograph, this x-ray taken. Look, here it is. Here's the catheter coming up his vein, going around, and if you follow it, there it is sitting in his right atrium. He got fired, basically, for doing this by the boss. He did actually have a career as a urologist. He had a bit of a checkered career, including joining the Nazi party and a few other things, but in fact was given a Nobel Prize very much later in his life because of this breakthrough, which allows us to do so many things. This is the first balloon invented by Andreas Grunzig by which he did an angioplasty. You couldn't go and buy one because no one had ever done it. It's a gigantic thing by the standards of what we do today. Nowadays, stents look like that, and they're tiny little things. There's one wrapped around a pencil to give you the idea of how tiny these things are on the way in. And just to summarize what we do now, this is a heart attack, someone I looked after within the last few weeks. I chose one where it was kind of easy to see. So this patient has come in, maybe off a helicopter from Wanaka or somewhere, with chest pain, they've got morphine on board, they come straight off the helipad into the catheter lab, nursing staff are looking after them, scrub up, enter through the wrist, and you can see there's an artery that stops right there, it doesn't go anywhere. The artery to the back of the heart looks healthy, now I've got a super fine little wire resting against that blockage point, see there? You shake this little hair-like wire, next thing you're through the artery and you've unblocked it. And this happens to have a really neat thing, you can see what the heart attack's caused by. So here, it was blocked. Here is all cholesterol goo, and here's the little crater that caused the clotting. So in other words, you have to imagine that the real artery is that shape and that little thing there cracked and the clot formed because of that inside the artery. That's the mechanism we now understand that caused all of those deaths in people. Now, obviously, this is pretty easy to fix now. You put a balloon in there, you blow it up, you make a bigger hole, you put a stent in and measure it up, and then you blow the stent up and bingo, bang, the whole artery's fixed, okay? Patient immediately feels better, sudden talks, 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 because they're full of morphine by this stage, and they're back around to the ward. And whoever's doing it, and there are five or so of us in this area, you go back to bed if it's in the middle of the night. You feel good about it, because you help somebody. And the team that does this stuff is remarkable, the nursing staff, the skilled technicians, the radiographers. We go in through that little thing in the wrist. And then we take them around to the ward and we see how big the heart attack is. This is an ultrasound scan. This too it was unheard of in the 1970s. It looks at the size of the heart attack and you can see this bit's all contracting and this bit's not because that's where that artery goes. So getting an idea of what's happening in the heart allows us to choose the right medications which also come from trials. So the patient leaves hospital two to three days later you actually, you'd be pretty lucky in Dunedin Hospital to get three days rest now, right? Remember, Ted and I, three weeks, and that was a radical shortening. And that's a very short time ago. They leave on these drugs, aspirin, ticagrelor. Each of those has been subjected to a massive mega trial, two or three of them, so we know that they add life saved. Now, of course, rehab's been tested, smoking cessation's not been checked in a, re in a randomized trial. That'd be hard to, you smoke, you don't, and just keep doing it for 20 years and see what happens. But there's so much data that it's overwhelming. And we only see people with big heart attacks probably only once. This is a striking difference. It's a giant step. If we think which of the things that I'm talking about have made the difference, all of them, this is for people who are used to looking at relative risks. This is a, a nice way of, of, pre of presenting this data from Derek Chu, who took 42,000 people in a big database called Monica, and was able to look at relative impact of each of the treatments because within that database, not everybody got all five things done. And you're able to do a very clever statistical weighting where you look at what adds what. So it turns out the biggest benefit, a reduction down to 0.58% risk, is by revascularizing, replumbing people if they come in with a heart attack. And then the next most important thing 
is just to take a cholesterol lowering drug called a statin and then it's antiplatelet agents, rehab, beta blockers and so on. So why did that graph get so much better? It's hard to say which of all of these things is the most important. But modelling shows that this remarkable decline is fueled by rapid progress in prevention and treatment, including precipitous declines in smoking, improvements in hypertension treatment and control, widespread use of statin drugs to lower circulating cholesterol, and the development of ti and timely use of clot-busting drugs called thrombolytics and stents in acute coronary syndromes to prevent a further heart attack. And the evidence for that statement comes from large cooperative megatrials and cardiology is really lucky. It's led the way in this area and other disciplines of course are doing the same thing to get an understanding of treatment strategies. They require multiple sites cooperating to get a clear answer. And as already, thank you for the kind introduction, I've actually done a lot of those mega trials over the years with a group of dedicated research nurses who have been absolutely outstanding at quietly putting patients into trials so that we can understand at points where we don't understand the right thing to do, what's the right thing to do. And these trials, these are kind of drug and strategy trials, but are also a number of first in man trials. Why do we do them? Well, we choose the, to enter the trials that have an important clinical practice point to answer, where there's a gap in the understanding of knowledge in the area, where the protocol's reasonable for the participants, where we can expect to find people who would join such a trial, where we have the resources to do it, and obviously where we can get some benefit from that to support other endeavours and research. I'm just going to go through a couple of these really quickly. Notice that for the academics that these things have gigantic impact factors. I'm going to only show you the, a few from the New England Journal, um, which is the highest ranked medical journal, in fact one of the highest ranked research journals in the world. Here, for instance, is the idea of a drip of one of the clot-busting drugs versus being able to give it as a bolus, which clearly makes it feasible, if you can just give it like that, to do it in an ambulance rather than in a hospital, showing that it made no difference to give it as a bolus. That's a big breakthrough to know that. Or, for instance, these are drugs, a group of drugs called, this one, Zimilofiban, which was a type of antiplatelet agent which was very expensive and it was challenging cheaper things like aspirin and ticlopidine that we use after coronary syndromes and stents. Turned out it was no better, this drug, and two or three others that we did trials for than the cheap stuff. Whew, that would have made a big dent on uh, medical spending if we'd believed the data without doing the mega trial. Here's a really important one. A weak statin called pravastatin was a subject of a very large trial of about 10,000, 9,000 patients only in Australia and New Zealand. And in this trial, we tended to put people who had had heart attacks, not all of them. It was weak, but over the years that we followed them, six or seven with excellent follow-up, you could see that not having a statin versus being on a statin saved a lot of lives. So that this trial and two or three others similar are just part of what we expect from standard care. They're in every practice guideline to every group that are involved in managing people with heart attack and with stroke. These trials really change what happens. We've been continuing to do this. This is one of the drugs that replaces an old drug called warfarin, which is dirt cheap, but patients never want to go on it because they have to have blood tests to get the settings right almost every week for the rest of their lives. So this trial, a very large trial, 14,000 patients, demonstrated that rivaroxaban, which you just took and never had to have a blood test, reduces the risk of stroke to the same level that warfarin does, and you never have to have a blood test. That's a big breakthrough. Here's a, a newer cholesterol-lowering drug, an injectable monoclonal antibody to get rid of something called PCSK9, which would be great to talk about, but we'll move. 
The placebo here is a big dose of statin already. Okay, so you're already on a statin and this is what your cholesterol is. And then you also have this two weekly or four weekly injection under your skin and it lowers the cholesterol dramatically down to numbers like 1.5. Now we used to think until we had a drug that would get you down that far that you really didn't need to go that low. Well, mostly because you couldn't get people down there. But when you can, you can demonstrate that there is a survival advantage if you are post heart attack or you've had a heart attack. So watch this space. These drugs are very expensive, but equivalents of these will turn up soon. Even things that we eat. So omega-3 products are much talked about. They have sold a lot in pharmacies, but actually there's no trial demonstrating any survival benefit from being omega-3s. Here is a, uh, one of those products, this one called Icosapent Ethyl. It's a highly specific omega-3, which completed this trial with a survival benefit, uh, a reduction in heart attack endpoint so that we can say that at least one specific omega-3 type product can deliver a survival advantage, although many of the others that have been tested similarly have not. So it's probably the type of omega-3 and not all of them. I've got, I think, 199 publications from such trials, and yes, they've been going on in lots of centres, to me, these are really important because they literally change outcomes across the world. They form guidelines. And that's where that data that I just quoted in a recent article about declining survival comes from. Let's go back to angioplasty because this is one of my great loves. So this whole space went from being, no, no, the cardiac surgeons fix hearts to, uh oh, no, the cardiologists fix hearts. I don't know whether Dick's in the audience, he'll get me later, Dick Bunton. Um, but in fact, we've been poking our noses into all sorts of places where we really shouldn't be. And partly that's because I have this innate need to buy every gadget. I'm the guy who goes on a rainy day to, uh, the, uh, you know, to, to the hardware store and walks around saying, oh my God, I need one of those. What does it actually do? <laughs> I've done a lot of device trials. Some of them are first in man's, and that means that we've done something in live human beings that's never been done before. And that's a particularly special kind of trial to do. And you don't do that without a lot of thought. It's often about whole new ideas, and some of these seem quite crazy. Uh, taking out this, for instance, in hepatic arteries, taking out the sympathetic nerves with uh, radiofrequency ablation in an effort to lower blood sugar. Not clear it works, it sort of goes in the right direction. I'll, why is this important? I think medicine requires innovation to improve. And innovation at times requires calculated risk. But I say calculated, and I think it needs to be done within the, the confines of trials where every single thing that can be anticipated is looked after, and then you do a trial of safety first. And it's only after you've proven safety that you go on to do, does the device deliver, right? It's always about safety first. I won't get into a long talk about uh, trial da trials or, a, and the implications of bioethics, but in fact, I've been obviously walking along the edges of that much of my career. Somebody had to do things first, and that included the first coronary implant of a stent by myself. And another thing I'm very proud of, that somehow I managed to introduce radial intervention, the thing I was showing you, rotobladers and a whole lot of other things that we won't stand around and look at. It turns out that rather than think of ourselves as isolated from the world in Dunedin, you know, the far corner, possibly the most southerly cath lab in the world, right? I haven't found anyone who can claim one in Argentina uh, that's any further south. It turns out that we have been relatively heavy hitters in the world of first in man research. Why did that happen? Well, it actually exploits the opposite of what you think a natural advantage that we have here. We have high levels of local expertise. 
which can't be matched easily at other places. We have low cost structures to do trials. We have a really excellent ACC system that really helps to do trials. We have organized central ethics, which mean that one ethics board covers the, New the whole of New Zealand, so things are standardized. We have excellent compliance. Patients are amazingly helpful in research in our area. They always turn up for their follow-up, almost with no exceptions. And we have a strong track record of doing the last one well, so we get to do the next one. And that resulted in a small group, about five hospitals, two in Melbourne, one in Sydney, Auckland and Dunedin, pioneering so many stents, right? Now, why drug-eluting stents? Well, when we first started putting stents in, the, the result on the angiogram, this nice open artery held up by that little mesh of stainless steel, was so phenomenally attractive that you just wanted to put them in everyone. But it turned out those early stents, called bare metal stents, sometimes provoked a kind of scarring reaction. So the same thing if you put a, a splinter in your finger, you'll sometimes have a very heaped up so-called proud flesh, right? Which would narrow the stent right back down to where you started by about three to six months. A lot of thought was put into why that was happening and probably changes in the struts on the stents has helped. But one of the ways of doing this is to build onto the stent a tiny microscopic layer like a wet X cloth that can hold on to a tiny quantity of an anti-proliferative or an anti-rejection drug. When you put the stent in, it therefore comes out very slowly into the wall of the artery over the next 40 days. And that turns off that response, and pretty much now all stents heal with no scar tissue in them at all. Now, it took a lot of work on what drug, what dose, what type of polymer to get that right, and first in man trials had to be done. I'm going to just run through some of them that were done here at the center. And in fact, what it results in effectively at that time, in about the late 90s into the early 2000s, there was probably about six or seven stents used around the world. Three of them had been first in man trialed in those five hospitals in Dunedin. And two of the others had been subjects of great big uh, database follow-ups. So we have a proud tradition of doing it first, and in a way leading, and I hope we can keep that up. Now, does that mean that everything went well? This is one trial where it clearly didn't. One of those drugs that looked like it could be promising is a really cheap drug called actinomycin. The drug that won in the end was called rapamycin and kind of was thought to be a bit similar. Its new name is Sirolimus. It wasn't similar. You can see the people who were randomized to bare metal stent here had better long lasting freedom from scar than actinomycin. And in fact, we had to come up with alternative management strategies in the small group of people in this trial. So in other words, without trials, we would not know what to have on the stent to get the end result. I guess one of the things that has changed outcomes for people in a practical sense is just the introduction of doing your heart operation through your wrist rather than a bigger catheter through the big artery in the leg. Now, in some people, that artery is a long way away from the surface. In others, it's not. And that means there's lots of bleeding. And when you filled people with clot busting drugs, it's kind of hard to do a catheter study in some folk. I happen to uh, be filling in about a half an hour between the lectures that I wanted to go to at a European Society of Cardiology meeting in about 1982, uh, 92. And I wandered and saw a poster on a wall and the owner of the poster standing beside it, and it turned out to be Ferdinand Kimene, who I've known ever since. And he had invented for the first time doing it from the heart and doing stents. Uh, it had been done as an angiogram prior to that the year before in France. It seemed such a good idea that I brought that home. And I've, I know that I really annoyed the nursing staff in the cath lab for years trying to get this right. But in fact, it became the standard. And by 2012, Myself and colleagues, uh, Coogan, got the data together, our trainee at the time, on how a whole hospital group 
had changed from doing mostly femoral to mostly radial, and that complication rates had just dropped away to nothing. And by this, I just mean that you felt the artery in the wrist, you put a little needle in, you pop that tube in, right? And you pull this thing out and you just pushed a clamp on it. I know I'm making some people feel sick, but th th you need to know what this is. It's just so ridiculously simple, but it actually is associated with better survival, right? More people live if they have it done that way than the bleeding risk from the leg when you do a lot of people who are in emergencies. And the, the, a very flattering editorial came when this paper was published, and I still smile at this. The editor wrote, because he was writing to an American audience who were really against making change, look, it happened quickly in Dunedin, it happened in a year. Regardless of the level of prior experience, even the fellows could do it, the trainees that is. With immediate reduction in bleeding complications to the delight of everyone, patients and staff, so why aren't you doing it? And I've often used that in lectures and treating uh, and teaching about radial intervention after that. I'm now gonna sort of speed through some of the other fun stuff in my life. In the end, this is about being able to see into the heart, because if you can't see, you couldn't do any of this stuff. In the 1970s, there was rudimentary screening in x-ray rooms, there was M-mode echo, and there was ECGs. And now we've got this suite of tools. Those who do this will know what they are. I'll show you what they look like. And I, it was suggested to be my norm, by Norma Restio that I should go off and learn about imaging. And that was the best thing you ever told me, Norma, because uh, that meant uh, that I was assisted into getting a overseas fellowship by the National Heart Foundation. And I was parachuted into one of the most uh, outstanding cardiology units in the world at uh, Mass General Hospital in Boston. That's me standing right there, okay? And, I, and, came, and who came with me? My wife, Barbara, and this little red-headed guy here came. And he was quite difficult in airports. Uh, and he ended up growing up to be a cardiologist as well, and he ended up having a National Heart Foundation Fellowship as well. And I think that's kind of a neat story. I'm just going to point out some of the things that I was involved with there, and maybe the impact that they made. Now, this is kind of... A, a, a kind of a confusing looking graph, but one of the papers that I'm very proud of uh, in retrospect is one of the only trials that, that's really looked at whether an echocardiogram, I've shown you one, can size a heart attack because it was unclear in 1984 whether you could do that. So I managed to convince Jim Southern who was so broad of accent from um, somewhere in the deep south that I could trouble understanding him sometimes, to find the people that I'd identified in Mass General who had had an echocardiogram within a day or so of dying of their heart attack and asked them to size the size of the heart attack from autopsy material by doing this, looking at the infarct size, measuring over the top, and quantifying it. We do this in experimental models uh, when, we're, when we're looking at heart attack sizing. And then from these simple views of an echocardiogram, those the echocardiographers here will recognize this, we were able, to, and we were working on this, produce a very interesting actual surface rendering of where the infarct was by this technique. And here, for instance, is the biggest heart attack out of that group. And you can see that the only bit left working is the circumflex territory there. Now, this demonstrated that if you took autopsy surface area and you took the echo, the functional heart attack size, that there was an amazing correlation. And that is what we do every day around the world to size up a heart attack now. We just do an echocardiogram. I read the first two sentences of my paper the other day and thought oh, I wasn't too far out, was I? With increasing interest in myocardial cells after presumed acute coronary occlusion, an accurate, repeatable measure of the amount of left ventricle rendered dysfunctional by the ischemic process is needed. Ideally, such a method should be quantifiably accurate, non-invasive and easily reproducible so that comparisons through time and through subjects can be made and coined the term a functional infarct size. 
Well, that's just fundamental stuff now, and I think many of you who are training probably forget that actually we didn't even know that back then. That data and, and that technique, I wish that it was available on Echo Machines, um, it, it, uh, it's well published and well validated. In fact, as I left Boston, I had already employed a fellow, Mike Picard, who became the head of the Echo Lab eventually at Mass General, and a research echocardiographer, and had done two lots of work. I'd started a trial watching heart attack patients to see what happened, and I also did a whole series of dog experiments to see how quickly these changes came on. Thanks to Mike, they all got published after I scarpered and came back to Dunedin. I'm going to move on. What did this work have as its impact? Well, a better understanding of the progressive changes that happen in heart attacks over time. The trials of reperfusion and stents made sense if you could see the heart attack, say, shrinking or not expanding over time. And drug trials such as ACE inhibitors and all the things that we give to stop the heart stretching after a heart attack have changed the outlook and kept people alive. Here's another really fun paper that I published at that time, which goes back to the very core of cardiology imaging. Uh, an outstanding clinician scientist, Liv Hatley, had published a book where, where she explored the theoretical things that you could do with sound going through uh, the narrowing of heart valves, and you could calculate from the Doppler equation and from fluid dynamics, the Bernoulli equation, you could calculate pressure drops very accurately in native valves, and work was done. But what was not known, did these assumptions apply to the very strange shapes that come with some prosthetic heart valves, where there's balls and cages and discs that tilt? So I was able to, uh, well, befriend people in the cath lab at Mass General, and they became very firm friends after that and convinced them that I needed to do simultaneously echocardiograms while they had catheters on either side of dysfunctional valves. And that data showed an amazing correlation. It was only at that time in 13 different prostheses. Note for the cath lab ladies that many of those cases were done by direct punctures of things like transeptals, right ventricular. You can see where it came from, can't you? Right. And this, basically, the impact of that paper was the first paper that had ever shown this assumption to be true. That basically, since it was true, no one needed to have a, a cardiac catheterization of that sort to prove that a valve was working or not working from there on in. And that basically means that that tool and the subsequent papers that validated my work uh, are part of standard cardiology practice now. I suppose the thing that had the biggest impact upon my career is this paper in July 1988 and a number of papers that followed where a very simple idea turned out to have a big effect. So the impact of what I'm now going to explain to you was a simple system to pick which patients would have a good result from a new procedure. Suddenly, in favourable cases, a balloon procedure in a conscious patient replaced heart surgery. And this had a really big impact in low-income countries with high rates of rheumatic heart disease because they didn't even have cardiac surgical programs, but some of them had cath labs. And actually, as a result of this development, a whole new branch of cardiology turned up. I've told you about interventional cardiology, that stenting. Well, this is another one called structural heart disease. What was this? In rheumatic heart disease, we worked out how to put a balloon in a valve and open it up successfully. Here's a patient with typical mitral stenosis. And those of you that look at echoes will see that the valve is stuck at its edges here and it's beautifully flexible, but it's stopping blood getting in from the left atrium, which is enlarged into the left ventricle. And this little hole should be open, the leaflet should open all the way out here, but there's just a small hole, probably less than a square centimetre, when really that valve should open up about four square centimetres. And you can see, here's that, the valve again, and this is transesophageal echo, you can even see the swirling blood as it clots. 
or it wants to clot because of the very narrowed outlet there. So once again, a quick 40 year tour. A brave cardiac surgeon from Japan constructed his own balloon, cut down on a vein, and did the very first balloon valvuloplasty in patients. It was sort of ignored in the West, but this paediatric cardiologist, Jim Locke from Boston Children's, uh, read the paper and headed off to India and did a number of cases because lots of rheumatic heart disease and younger people in India. There was very nice results obtained. He then came back and because basically rheumatic heart disease in Western countries is often in much older people because of antibiotics to stop recurrent throat infections and the development of rheumatic heart disease. The cases that were done back in Boston where I happened to be working at the time had very variable results. Some were great successes and some were absolutely awful and it just wasn't clear why. I had been sitting watching these echoes coming through with my then mentor Ned Wayman and I would say to him this one will work and this one won't and actually mostly I was kind of right and he said how you know you got to be able to make some numbers around this and fundamentally I knew this because I'd trained with Pat Malloy the foundational cardiac surgeon in Dunedin who did an operation a primitive operation by current standards where without putting someone on bypass, you put them to sleep of course, you'd make a big thoracotomy, normal will remember this, the lung was deflated and the operating surgeon sewed his finger into the heart at the left atrial appendage, felt the valve and split it with his finger. And those surgeons knew that the patients who had heavily thickened calcified valves wouldn't do well but those that very flexible valves they would split it was so obvious but you can't see that unless you do an echocardiogram I happen to describe the difference between a mobile thickened and calcified valve and gave it some numbers and it turned out that that predicted very nicely who would have a success with this procedure here's such a procedure being done and I guess what I'm showing you here, this in a way's original balloon. The valve is being held right there. The balloon tends to grab it and hold it in that divot and then the valve splits. Now you can't even see the valve, can you? That's my point, right? So in order to understand and do this whole stuff, we need to be able to see in the heart because cardiac surgeons can see the valve. We can't. We need the imaging tools. Here's an echo showing the before and after of such a procedure in that very early data. And what I was basically saying is that this valve, which is just stuck on its tips, but it's basically nice and flexible, will work. And this heavily calcified when one, even though we might split it, is not going to open up well. Don't do that one. Put a new valve in. That's a cardiac surgical case. Data over the next 10 years, from just from Mass General, many hundreds of cases because it became the centre, one of the three big centres that did this in the US, showed that this score, called the Wilkins score nowadays, at eight, it was good to do it and you got a big improvement, but actually after that the success rate was foul, you see? And the improvement in the valve area, so that in fact, I even got the midpoint right in the score because it's out of 16 and about the middle is where you would not, a chance, um, that you would not send such a patient. What followed then was five randomised trials all using that valve score uh, to select cases and it demonstrated against cardiac surgery, the gold standard, that the procedure was at least as good equivalence and that was it. Who would have cardiac surgery if you could have a balloon procedure? Many of these people are very young and can need be have it again, but it's incredibly durable if you do this procedure well. So this lesson was that outcomes are predicted by case selection and cardiac structures can be assessed by really good imaging. And these non-invasive tools that were growing in front of me ended up being the key to unlocking a lot of less invasive procedures. But you had to do trials and you had to analyze data. Of course, that led this guy, a Frenchman, Alain Crebier, 
to do the stupidest thing I've ever heard of is what his cardiac surgeon told him when he dreamed up the idea of putting a valve into the aortic site on a balloon that he made himself. And that, of course, is what we do, Anushka and Ben do. They did three today of these in people who have severely narrowed aortic valve. We just fix it now from the leg with the patient a little sedated but effectively talking to you while you put their new valve in. And they walk out of hospital the next day. Now, how do we get there? We get there by teaching and training. We work, as in most medical teams, within a sort of a team approach where people have different subspecialties. The cognitive skills are taught. They come as kind of modules. There are specific things you need to use. That's difficult to write down. And so one of my loves, and I think one of my contributions, has been this, talking, talking, talking. Because in the end, unless you go through live case demonstrations with faculty, expert faculty discussing why you'd do it slightly this way rather than do it that way, this is very difficult to pass on and spread across the world. But I've been lucky enough to be involved in a lot of that. And there are all of these different procedures that I won't dwell on. And once again, the hero is the imaging. I'm going to quickly, as I close, show you a couple of kind of interesting things. We don't have to do the same thing over and over again because you can design the right thing for this unique situation. Let me show you this case, which is kind of interesting. Here's an echocardiogram, which those of you who do echoes will say, that looks a little strange. There's another chamber. Yeah, there is. There's the left atrium, there's the left ventricle, and there's something high velocity, that's blood on Doppler imaging, going into something weird. When we bring that patient back to Dunedin, we can see in a transesophageal echo, here's the mitral valve, here's the aortic valve, here's the left ventricle. There's a weird hole into a big cavity. And that cavity is really big, that's it there. And it shouldn't have anything in there at all. And I just want to show you how good CTs are. Oh, come on, doesn't want to. This runs usually. There's a very narrow neck in this Dr. Restio will immediately recognize a rare thing called a pseudoaneurysm where the wall of the left ventricle has ruptured. Now, how the hell are you going to fix that? Call the cardiac surgeon would that be the usual answer. But in fact, you can fix that nowadays. The same thing would apply, there it is, right? The same thing would apply to leaks after, say, infections around valves. Here's a mechanical valve sitting in a patient, and here is a big defect and there's just an enormous amount of high velocity blood leaking around the outside of it. Now this would be a cardiac surgical case, but we can see this in such detail, look, 3D reconstruction of that valve working with its hinged device. You can see even the sutures holding it in, there's the hole. We can measure the size of it, work out the plug, work out a strategy. We can even work out how to get to that from CT angles of the chest and work out the line of flight. So we can fix paravalvular leaks and pseudoaneurysms like that. So how do we fix that one? Well, you can't get at that. You might be able to come around there, but that'd be difficult. It's much easier just to go clean through the wall of the heart, something that we would not usually do. But if you plan procedures like this, you literally can do that. Here's exactly that happening, right? Here's a, 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 a wire down an artery so we don't hit that. And basically, we're able to place a wire and then a tube straight through to the edge of a valve. How does that look? There's lots of imaging going on here. We've got all sorts of images up in a cath lab simultaneously, including transesophageal echo imaging going on, because that's where the real information comes from. Here's my jottings about where I'm going to find the holes. There's a hole around the outside of a valve. We can see them. Here's crossing through pulling a plug back into place, I'm moving quickly here, there's one plug put in, and then we, there it is right there on the imaging, you can see it's snugged into the hole. Here's the other hole over the other side, so pretty simple matter to put another plug through that one, pull that one down, you can see these little expanding plugs that are left in place, snug it up and leave it. So here's one plug here, here's another one here, and there's the two valves that this patient has. 
and the imaging is amazing. Here's one of those valves and there's two little plugs around the side, a little bit like Mickey Mouse. And of course you've got to plug the hole as you leave through the apex. These things can be done because of the imaging breakthroughs that happened over that 40 odd years. And we can do things that previously we would never be able to do because of those imaging changes. That's led to further first in man trials. We're currently working on a, one of the most frustrating areas of cardiology management, patients who have something called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We can show the dramatic rise in, in lung pressures that these people have. And then we take a tiny little puncture out of the walls between two chambers to act as a blow off valve. We cause an atrial septostomy Here's that in follow-up with an MRI. You can see this tiny little hole to allow this chamber to be decompressed into that one as people start exercise. And the follow-up data suggests that this makes people feel better and we're about to go into a phase two trial in 77 hospitals around the world as a result of this first in man data that we did in little old Dunedin, that hospital. As a result of 40 years, I've been lucky enough to be involved in the training of 22, I think, fellows. Five of whom, I've put little asterisks, including Professor Mike Williams and Anushka Moina, Sean Coffey, Sadish Lal, and Peter McLeod, who have come back and joined on staff, and are my colleagues. And a number of PhD and higher um, studies uh, candidates who've got their PhDs sorted out, perhaps uh, a little bit by my help. I'm just going to show a couple of these things here. Uh, Saranga Zasanaka has done a trial of just putting the exercise recommendations into place and watching people's blood pressures, this is on ambulatory blood pressure, uh, who have resistant hypertension. So these are people who are on up to three or four drugs to get their blood pressure down and you can see just doing some exercise, which has been shown before, but not that much, lowers your blood pressure. I've been involved in, with Mike, uh, uh, with Mike, with uh, Rob Walker, in all sorts of animal studies, uh, looking at uh, the healing of uh, kidneys and heart after heart attacks and the ameliorating effects of spinal lactone. Uh, Catherine Leader's PhD came from this data. I'm just going to go through it quickly. I've been involved with a lot of physiology work with my friend Chris Baldy and many of his PhD candidates have come up with outstanding things and that work continues on. It's not all been um, work. I, I've done the odd thing. I've felt an obligation to the National Heart Foundation because of what they did for me. You know, I got to Boston and enjoyed that. So uh, about 10 years ago, I ended up with uh, other cardiologists riding the length of New Zealand, and I'm pleased to tell you that it only took us 13 days. And if you look at some of those distances, it's 200 plus a day. You had to get fit for that. We raised five million for the National Heart Foundation. Jenny Shipley was the patron of that, and there were no injuries. It kind of exhausting, though, fronting the, the uh, yeah. What do I predict for the future? Uh, I think there'll be a progressive, relentless drive towards less invasive procedures. Most new technologies actually currently dovetail into what you can and can't do in cardiac surgery anyway. We're not taking it away. And we often end up meeting unmet need. People who may be just a bit too sick to get through cardiac surgery can be well managed in these other ways. Of course, it'll raise a whole new thing with fair access and provision of services. But any procedure that avoids anesthesia and open surgery leads to faster discharge and more rapid rehab. And of course, with a burgeoning older population, we're keeping everyone alive longer. They often have very treatable disease and it's much better to manage people in minimally invasive manners. I think we'll see a steady rate of coronary intervention. It it hopefully will decline as we get better at getting people on cholesterol lowering drugs and blood pressure agents. We'll see a spectacular growth in TAVI procedures and we'll see growth in pacing and percutaneous interventions of all sorts. It's now time for me to thank you for coming. I'm overwhelmed honestly by the size of the audience. 
I owe a great debt to the mentors who taught me, Norma Restio and Ned Wayman and those in the US. But I also owe an enormous debt to my own colleagues. You know, my colleagues today are my biggest support. And that includes my cardiac surgical colleagues as well. And also to the very skilled nursing staff and cath labs, coronary care units, and also my dedicated research nurses, three of whom stayed with me for 35 years um, and uh, are only just qu quietly thinking of retiring now. I also owe a debt to all the students that I've taught because I've loved teaching students and I've got to say it keeps me young and keeps my brain nimble when you get asked questions that you can't readily explain. It does make you think simply and that's probably a good idea. And to my family, what can I say? Thank you. Thank you for listening. I happen to be in the right time and the right place. That would sum up my career. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't know, do I sit down or do I stay? You stay here. I'm okay. <laughs> I think that's what you're after. Yes, Jerry, you do get your gift, but you have to hang on for just a second. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that just an amazing talk? I really, really enjoyed your talk and I think the audience did as well. The weather outside is nothing against this hurricane wind of uh, Jerry Wilkins to his journey of cardiology. Outside is just a summer breeze, I guess. Um, I, I loved it how you, how you started um, your journey with uh, mentioning the year 1979 and you got it in the right order because you do want to have dinner at some point again tonight. Yes. Um, you mentioned BARB first as the first experiment and then you graduated. Yes. I don't know if that was the right order but at least that's, that's how you brought it across. <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course a cardiologist talks about rhythm and you had to start with music. Um, that, that was a given but um, saving lives is is really the motto that we heard here tonight and and you really t played a really big part in that when you showed these graphs of of diminishing mortality obviously as a gastroenterologist i would say well this is cancer screening but it's not it's cardiac mortality it's it's really um your organ rather than the organ that i work with that um saves lives there. i'm hoping you'll get there <laughs> oh god yeah it will take a while um between 1978 and 2002, stopping heart attacks. That's a term I have never heard before, but obviously that was the big deal, that you, you could or were then eventually able to stop a heart attack from getting worse and worse and worse and taking the whole organ out. That was fantastic. Introducing us to mega trials. Well, yes, thousands of patients are needed. And isn't it exciting if you have such a illustrious career and a long-standing career that many of the things Jerry mentioned that, uh, that have been in trial situations during your time are just given. Metoprolol, I mean, who would not know metoprolol? But obviously it was against a placebo. Is that even ethical, Lindley? From, from where we're standing now, probably not anymore, no. but absolutely amazing. Your journey through interventional cardiology, you said someone had to do it, someone had to start it. I also liked it that you can teach monkeys to do it, um, but that's a different, why do we employ so many cardiologists? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Werner Forstmann, yes, they are always these pioneers in medicine who try things themselves, and uh, he truly was a pioneer. Yes. Um, you mentioned several times you were just at the right place at the right time. Well, I think it's a bit more than that, isn't it? It, it takes a brave man to take on these challenges, but also a man who sits down and thinks about these things, who doesn't go recklessly into somebody's heart, who really thinks about what can be done, what should be done, and what's, what's good for that person. 199 publications just on these mega trials alone with impact factors of 74 and more, that is amazing. When I read your resume and you, you came up to the department and said, hmm, I, I think I should apply for, for promotion and this is my resume, my immediate response was, why, why didn't you do it 10 years ago, 15 years ago? 
Honestly, I mean, it was such I a I was long... too busy, actually. <laughs> I now realize that. You had to save lives. You were just too busy, and that's the humble person that you are. Hardware store on the weekends. Yeah, some of the things you talked about tonight, you probably got at the hardware store, so I'm not sure what MedSafe <laughs> says about that. Uh, first in man trials, drug eluting stents. I mean, you, you, you must have done it all. It's really the fundamental stuff that we take for granted that you were part of developing and, and that you still part of developing. Taking on the cardiac surgeons, that's a, that's a good thing. If I remember Dick Bunton right, I mean, he's about two heads taller and a bit more massive. Well, taking him on and he's, he's stitching his finger into a heart and you just replaced him by a balloon. Not bad, I say, not bad. Your cath lab really looks now like Starship Enterprise. It's it not does. like it did look in the past. Plugging holes, you're probably the guy who everybody wants to have around when the roof leaks. Fantastic stuff. I thank you so much for um, the work you've done. I even more thank you for the teaching. I thank you for all the other things that you have done over your many years of, of that. I think it's testament that you had so many uh, trainees, so many students that awarded you, and that came back to the department. I think that's the, the best testament that you're a fantastic teacher. You're a fantastic guy. I'm really proud to be your colleague. And on behalf of the university, you don't know what's in there. I know. But never guess. <laughs> never guess. I thank you very much. Before thank you, Michael. we all break out into another round of thank you, uh, can I please invite everybody to join uh, Jerry and the rest of the academic party to come over to the staff club to have a well-deserved de well refreshments and a few of uh, our personal um, moments with, with Jerry. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Very well, kind of you to